Beautiful. So for those who weren't here last week, I need to catch you up a little bit. And, uh, and we're, as I mentioned to the children, we are in a sermon series called Don't Ever Let a Song Sing You. And the genesis for this sermon series was uh, our choir gathers where the children gathered this morning on Sunday mornings to get ready, kind of our back kind of area back here, reception area and, and conference room. And our choir, as they, they tend to do, we're cutting up a little bit, and Lucan's usually the ringleader with that. And, and uh, Lucan is one of our, our staff singers, and, and he looked at someone, and he said, don't ever let a song sing you. And, and as soon as I heard that, I knew that that needed to be preached. I wasn't sure at the moment how it was going to be preached, but I knew it needed to be preached. Don't let a song sing you. And so last week, we, we began with um, Romans 12, uh, verses 1 and following, the first couple of verses. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. And so last week we talked about not being conformed. This world does so much to try to kind of slam us into a box and make us all look the same, this kind of monolithic nothingness that does no one any good. I got to thinking about it some more this week. We talked a little bit about American Idol and how, how uh, the, early on they're always singing someone else's song. And, and, and sometimes it it's almost comes across karaoke-like. This week when I was thinking about it, I was thinking about the song, what's, what's a song that all of us have heard probably hundreds of times in our lives and heard hundreds of different renditions of that is very difficult to sing? The national anthem. We have sat at sporting events and, and, and uh, civic functions and we have heard people sing the national anthem. There are times when we just glow with national pride and there are times when we cringe and look away and feel sorry. Now, I'll be honest with you, if anybody's going to get up in front of whether it's 10 or 10,000 or 10 million and sing that song, then they deserve kudos. But there was one rendition of that song that I think most everyone who saw it would never forget it, and that was Whitney Houston singing the national anthem at the Super Bowl in 1991. Now, first of all, when I looked that up this week to remember when it was, I couldn't believe that that was 24 years ago. Next year is Super Bowl 50. That was Super Bowl 25. So the fact that that was 24 years ago is something. Um, how many of you remember watching that live that day? Yeah, there's a number of us that remember watching that live that day. There were a lot of, it, it was the perfect storm, if you will, because it was uh, 10 days into the first Gulf War, and so there was a renewed uh, heightened sense of patriotism. There was some question whether we would even play the Super Bowl, I think, that year, because it's obviously in the midst of war and, and, a, and a gathering of that many people. But it went on, and Whitney Houston was at the height of her career, she was healthy, and her voice had never been better. And she stood out in the middle of that field in a, in a white jumpsuit. And, and if there was ever a person who took that song and made it her own, it was Whitney Houston. A song that's difficult to sing, a song that many would agree needs to be sung within certain boundaries. Sometimes when people try to make that song their own, it goes awry. But Lucan challenged us, don't let a song sing you. And Whitney Houston did not let the national anthem sing her. If anything, she redefined how that song should be sung. But today, we kind of move from, from that to singing our own song, writing our own music, creating our own place in this world. Because the reality is this world needs each of us to be exactly who God created us to be. And so we continue with the Romans verse that I've already read for us again this morning. And then we'll go several places in the Psalms this morning. Because often in the Psalms we, 
The Psalms themselves often are songs, and they call us to song. And so, to begin this morning, let's look at these two Psalms, 95 and 96. The beginning of Psalm 95, O come, let us sing to the Lord, let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving, let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. I like that it says make a joyful noise because if you've heard me, as you've heard me tell the children this morning and those who know me well know you really don't want to hear me sing. But I love to sing and I love to make a joyful noise. And then if we go to Psalm 96. Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord and bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be revered above all gods. For all the gods of the peoples are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Will you pray with me? O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Think with me for a few minutes this morning, singing our own song. Music is inspired by so many things. I love being outdoors. I love being outside. The other morning, uh, a couple weeks ago, Shannon and I both were awakened by a songbird just outside our window in our home. It was a beautiful morning like this. The sun came up early, and that bird was excited to be alive. We weren't so excited at how early that bird was to be alive, but it was this beautiful song, and certainly... Birds singing are one of those things that inspires our own music. There are so many things in nature. The rush of a mighty waterfall, it, 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 you can hear the sound. It's, it's so, if you've ever been to hear a waterfall, it's so, such a distinguished sound. What's amazing about a waterfall is if you're hiking to go to a waterfall, you can begin to hear it before you can ever see it. It it starts as a a faint sound and it grows stronger and stronger as it crescendos until you find yourself in the presence of that amazing power. The same thing is true of the ocean. The ocean can be that general lap of the waves against the sea or against the seashore, against the beach, but it also can be uh, the waves crashing against the rocks or the sand. I love thunderstorms as long as I have a safe place to be during them. And the loud clap of thunder, cymbals clashing, or the the loud strike of a, a timpani or a bass drum. The sound of the rain on a metal roof. A gentle breeze blowing through the dry autumn leaves. All of these things inspire our music and they inspire our song. So the question that we have to ask ourselves is, is in in our lives, what things inspires us, inspires our songs as we go to write our own music? And last week what I said is when I I say this, I want to be careful that what I'm saying is not that we're autonomous, not that we're doing this separated from one another because... In, in the passage from Romans, what Paul goes on to do is remind us that all of this happens and must happen within community. Nothing happens apart from us being in community and connected to one another. But as is often the case in Paul's writings to the various churches, he reminds us that we are the body of Christ and each of us have our role to play. And so we have to figure out what that is. Several years ago when Shannon and I had the opportunity to be at the Chick-fil-A Operator Seminar, one of the sessions was they brought in an orchestra and and they brought in the conductor 
and, and an entire session was devoted to how that conductor took all of these different instruments to create the beautiful music that would be presented. And how the slightest variation of, of movement in his hand or his baton indicated how each of the members of the orchestra were to, to change their music just slightly. But yet within that orchestra, each, each member is given some latitude in, into how their particular style works its way into the overall beauty of the piece. And ultimately, even though I'm going to talk about us writing our song, we know that that song has to be, must be, desperately needs to be connected to God's purpose for our lives. But what's important to remember is that as we, we say, don't let a song sing you. Last week, I said it this way, which, which is we must not let, her, let others define who we are. Another way to say that is don't ever let anyone else tell your story. Don't let others tell our story. Our story is ours. It is that story which was created and has lived itself out in our lives. Now, the world likes to tell other people's stories, and they like to do so by, by making snap, quick judgments about who we are. They see it as, at a moment in time, and they make a judgment about who we are and where we've come from and what we stand for. And we cannot allow the world to do that. We have to tell our own story. We have to write our own song. Now, as I said to the children, that songs come about in, in many different ways. And Ariel should probably be doing this part of the, of the sermon this morning because he knows far more about how, and Kathy know far more about how music is composed, how one might sit down with a blank staff. I've talked about the blank sheet of paper, but a blank staff staring back at you. And maybe you have words to which you're trying to marry the music, or maybe you're trying to do both. Or maybe you have music and you're trying to write words to bring that music to fuller life. For us, it's the same way in our daily lives. We're, we're trying to pull all these pieces together, who we are, where we've come from, what our families are like, what we're currently doing. All of those pieces kind of come together in different ways that help inform who we are and what that song will sound like. I found this wonderful resource online. It's from, the, um, from the, the Center for Christian Ethics at Baylor University, and it's just this awesome resource that I'd never found before I was working on this sermon series. And there's various, uh, there, there's a weekly kind of subscription to that, and there's all kind of writing and, and different things. And one of the things is, is that they have new music that's been written, and they talk about the gifts of new music. And so it was interesting that that the Romans text from last week was married with this uh, text from the Psalter, the 96th Psalm. And, and it's talking about three different hymn writers and three new hymns that were being talked about. Um, and the, the, the first one um, was uh, pianist Mark Hill. And, um, and he had been inspired by having gone to work on a Habitat for Humanity project. And in writing his hymn, he, he used the time on that project. Now, that's another place where sounds are there, the sound of a saw cutting through wood, a hammer against a nail, and then the beauty of a family having a roof over their head. But he said something very interesting, and in there's, there's some brief interviews with each of these, these writers, and he says, Worship does not end when the last amen is spoken. In fact, worship has just begun. Both worship and service look toward the day when all people live in peace and all creation joins to sing a song of praise to its creator. Ultimately, as we're writing our own songs, living out the lives that have been set forth before us, what we also have to keep in mind is that that song ultimately is lifted with other voices in praising God and giving thanks for God's creation. I love this one. Um, Mel Bringle 
says that words are like shy forest creatures. They often seem more willing to come into view if they do not think they are being sought. How many of us, when we're trying to remember something we, we can't quite recall, it's only after we've been distracted for a moment by something else that it kind of slips back in to our consciousness. When we're trying to think of just the perfect thing to write, whether it be in a letter or for a speech or for a sermon, it's often when we allow our mind to be cleared and remove all of the distractions that finally we're able to focus and those words come to us. And finally, this from Kyle Matthews, who was one of the three who were written about in this particular article. And I think this is, this is the focus of where we need to be this morning. The ultimate hope of our singing is that God will hear beyond our presentation to our heart's intention. Thus, hear our hearts. That, that it would hear beyond our presentation Much like we don't want to allow others to tell our story and much like we don't want a song to sing us. We also have to be very careful in how we present ourselves. We live in a world in which it is extremely tempting to present something other than who we truly are. We live in a culture when, in which we we're desperately always trying to be what it is we think the world wants us to be, allowing others to define who we are, letting the songs sing us rather than to sing the songs. And so we need to live in a world in which we celebrate our uniqueness. Not that we all look and think and talk exactly alike. We see those temptations in high school and in, in middle school and even younger now. Clothing is often one of those places where it lives itself out. And I said last week that my favorite music is good old-fashioned 80s hairband music. And if you're a child of the 80s, then, then somewhere along the way, you were probably tempted to wear a members-only jacket or a pair of parachute pants. Everyone had them. Mine were bright red and came from the merry-go-round at North Lake Mall. <laughs> they were amazing. But the fact of the matter is that over the years, I cared less about what others thought about what I wore or what I drove. I'm perfectly happy in a pair of jeans and an untucked polo shirt. There are a number of folks here this morning that know that when I was at Peachtree Road, I couldn't get away with that when Don Harp was around the corner. Someone who wears a tie and a pocket square every day of his life when his, when his young associate would come in in jeans and a shirt, that was not going to happen. We still joke about that frequently. But each of us have to create our own space, be willing to be unique, be willing to put ourselves out there, write our own songs. So much of how that song comes together is, is what we're influenced by, who we spend time with, the things we enjoy doing most. Because each of those things begin to work their way into how we define our lives and write those verses and put a melody to that song. It's amazing to think that, that we have this relatively blank slate. And the good news is, and this goes back to the first Sunday of the new year, the good news is that every moment, every day is a, an opportunity for a new start, <coughs> a fresh start and a new beginning. Particularly for those people of faith who believe that, that God gives us those opportunities day in and day out. The ultimate hope of our singing is that God will hear beyond our presentation to our heart's intention, and that ultimately our presentation matches our heart, that all of it is 
completely in sync with each other. Miss Carol put this up here for me. That's good because my, my throat's trying out this morning. <coughs> Excuse me one second. So how do we do this? What are some practical things we can do as we, as we wrap up this morning? Be true to ourselves. Now, being true to ourselves meaning, <coughs> means that we know ourselves. Knowing ourselves can often be a difficult task. Knowing ourselves re- requires us to look in the mirror, to be introspective, to understand who we are. Part of understanding who we are is knowing what we stand for, what we believe in, as we echoed the words of Dr. King last week. <coughs> a person can only know why they're alive if they know why they would be willing to die. And so for us, <coughs> to be willing to know, <coughs> excuse me, y'all. <coughs> A willingness to be exactly who we are, not trying to be someone else, is so critical. (coughs) Allowing the outside to match the inside, and the inside to match the outside. With each year that passes, I become more and more comfortable in my own skin, not trying to be <clears throat> anyone else. <coughs> Goodness. Not trying to be anyone else. And each of us can struggle with that. So we need to first know who we are. We need to be willing to own who we are, live in <coughs> to who we are. We need to embrace those parts of us that are our very best. Not be too critical of ourselves for those parts of us that are not exactly the way we'd want them to be. Know who we are, embrace who we are, and be who we are. It's so important that we're willing to be exactly who the world needs us to be. How do we do that? We, we do that by surrounding ourselves with people who will love us for just who we are. We need to love others for just who they are. And we need to embrace the incredible uniqueness in each person so that we can hear what is in their hearts, so that we can listen for their song. For in being willing to hear the song of another, we can begin to write our own song. And ultimately, a beautiful melody and harmony will come together, creating a pleasing sound to God and music that can change the world. It's time for each of us to write our own songs.